If you were a gamer living in Japan in late 1990, it was tough to get Nintendo's newest console, the 16-bit Super Famicom. Nintendo received 1.5 million pre-orders from wholesalers, but could only ship out 300,000 consoles on launch day. Retailers and consumers weren't happy, accusing Nintendo of creating a false shortage to drive up demand. But Nintendo denied the allegation, and promised to increase its manufacturing capacity the following year. In the meantime, many people had to sit and wait. But there was another way to get a hold of a Super Famicom, although it was an expensive option. On December 5th, 1990, Two weeks after the Super Famicom launched, electronics manufacturer Sharp released the 21G SF1, a 21-inch television with a Super Famicom built into it. It cost 133,000 yen, or around $1,000. For comparison, a Super Famicom cost 25,000 yen, or around $200. Sharp initially shipped out 10,000 SF-1 units, but hoped to move 20,000 by the end of 1990, and they likely sold quite a few. One source in Famitsu Magazine commented that, given that there are some people who want to get a Super Famicom before anyone else, they may buy this no matter the price. In March of 1991, Sharp released a smaller 14-inch version, the 14G SF-1. It retailed for 100,000 yen, or around $750. It's important to mention that the SF-1 television wasn't a huge surprise. Sharp and Nintendo had a good business relationship and routinely worked together on products. For example, in the 1970s, Sharp provided the solar cells for Nintendo's beam gun toys. In the 1980s, Sharp supplied the electronics for Nintendo's Game & Watch handhelds. In 1983, Nintendo released their first cartridge-based video game console, the Famicom. In that same year, Sharp released the C1, a television with a built-in Famicom. There were both 14-inch and 19-inch models, and they sold reasonably well for Sharp. The company shipped 100,000 units. In 1986, Sharp released the Twin Famicom, a hybrid console that contained a Famicom and a Famicom disk system. When the Famicom made its way over to North America as the Nintendo Entertainment System, it exploded in popularity. So, in 1989, Sharp released a 19-inch television with an NES built-in, although it wasn't nearly as successful as its Famicom counterpart. So the fact that Sharp made a TV with a Super Famicom inside makes perfect sense. I have here the 21-inch version of the SF-1. Was it worth all that extra money? Let's take a look. The Sharp SF-1 came with two controllers and a remote. Unfortunately, I do not have the remote. The controllers look and feel identical to a standard Super Famicom controller, but have unique SF-1 branding. The cords are also longer. The SF-1 controller cord is about six feet, while a Super Famicom controller cord is about three feet. Since there was no console to create distance between you and the TV, a longer cord on the controller was necessary. As far as design, this is a pretty standard looking television with a Super Famicom on top of it, almost like a little hat. On the front are two controller ports. Next to those is a panel that contains a headphone jack and a few buttons. First, there is a channel memory configuration. Next to that is an input selector. You can choose between the Super Famicom, cable television, or the composite inputs on the back of the TV. There are also channel up and down buttons as well as volume up and down buttons. Finally, a power display and a power button are on the far right. Unfortunately, you cannot adjust video settings like brightness directly on the television. Instead, you need the remote, which I don't have. The remote actually had a few cool features. You could reset your game directly from it. It also had a video setting called Game Position, which instantly switched to the ideal brightness level for video games. On the back of the TV are composite inputs and VHF or UHF cable hookups. On top of the TV is the Super Famicom. 
There's a power switch, a reset button, the cartridge slot, and a cartridge eject button. Behind this is a sliding dust cover containing two ports, the extension port and a multi-out port. These were two interesting additions to the SF-1. Sharp's previous Famicom TV, the C1, was criticized because it wasn't compatible with the Famicom disk system. So for the SF-1, Sharp decided to future-proof their television by including an extension port and a multi-out port. Let's start with the multi-out port. This works just like the one on the Super Famicom or Super Nintendo console. You can output the audio and video to another source. It supports composite, S-video, and RGB. Unfortunately, the video does not work on my multi-out port, but you get the idea. Playing something like Super Mario Kart with another player on two televisions would be pretty cool. Then there's the extension port. This one is a little bit of a mystery. On a standard Super Famicom and Super Nintendo, the 28-pin extension port is on the bottom of the console. Nintendo added this port for potential accessories in the future. But on the Sharp SF-1, the 28-pin extension port is smaller and has a different form factor. It resembles the image in port on Sharp's X68000 compact computer. Most likely, Sharp changed the port because of the design of the television. The extension port on the Super Famicom was on the bottom because the console would mount on top of any peripheral. But for the SF-1, Sharp couldn't do that. So they changed the design of the port to use a cable. At the time of the SF-1's release, no devices used the extension port. So Sharp probably thought, well, we can always sell a cable if something comes out. Only two retail devices used the extension port in the Super Famicom and Super Nintendo's lifetime. The first was the Lifecycle Exertainment Bike, released in 1994. A module hooked into the extension port and connected to an exercise bike that worked with a few different games. The second was the Nintendo Satellaview, released in 1995. It was a Japan-only peripheral that allowed players to download games via satellite broadcasts. However, I have never seen any cable made by Nintendo or Sharp that could hook the SF-1 into these peripherals. My guess is that by the time these devices came out, there was little to no demand from SF-1 owners for a cable. So in theory, the SF-1 will work with these devices, but you'll need a cable, and probably a custom one. Now, let's get to the games. Super Famicom cartridges load into the top of the TV in the cartridge slot. The Sharp SF-1 is also compatible with Super Nintendo games. However, just like the Super Famicom, the cartridge slot's design prevents you from inserting the game. You'll need to modify the slot or use an adapter to play your Super Nintendo games. But the bigger question is, how do the games look? The video quality is spectacular. Inside the SF-1, the Super Famicom hooks into the television via S-Video. This looks better than the standard composite hookup, but not as good as an RGB connection. Either way, it's a beautiful picture, and the camera does not do it justice. The SF-1 plays any game the Super Famicom can, including special cartridges like the Super Game Boy. The biggest disappointment is the audio. The Sharp SF-1 has mono sound that comes from one speaker on the left side of the TV. This is a huge bummer, as the Super Famicom produced stereo sound. If you want stereo sound, you have to use a multi-out cable on the back and hook it into external speakers. And that pretty much sums up the Sharp SF-1. At the time, the press praised the television as a way to save space in your living room. Retail stores used the SF-1 to show off new games, but it was costly. The average 21-inch television at the time cost around 85,000 to 90,000 yen. The Super Famicom was 25,000 yen. So it was cheaper to buy a TV and console separately than to get an SF-1. But it was an option during the Super Famicom stock shortage. It's unclear how many units Sharp sold. A few magazines at the time had brief write-ups on the TV, including Electronic Gaming Monthly, Mean Machines, and Popular Science. But the Sharp SF-1 never got a release outside of Japan. 
Oddly, I find this TV a lot when looking at pictures and videos for research. Here's a photo of Japanese pop star Aiko with an SF1. And here's a video of a retail store showing off Sonic the Hedgehog 2 on, ironically, a Sharp SF1. Today, the Sharp SF1 is more of a collector's piece than anything else. It's not the ideal way to play the Super Famicom, but it is a neat little piece of video game history. That's all for this episode of The Gaming Historian. Thanks for watching. Funding for Gaming Historian is provided in part by supporters on Patreon. Thank you.